Japanese tales. No compromise. Gendayu, who lived in Sunaki province, was a fierce hunter and a killer. Dawn or dusk, he was out in the wilds after deer and fowl, or fishing, and the day rarely passed when he did not chop off someone's head, arm, or leg. He knew nothing about karma or religious faith, and naturally only hated and shunned holy men. In a word, he was a menace, and people were terrified of him. He was coming home one day from hunting deer in the mountains with some of his band when he noticed a crowd in front of a building and asked what the people were doing. His men told him the place was a temple and that a monk was preaching there. Preaching, they explained, means offering the Buddha a sermon on the Holy Sutras for the benefit of all beings. Oh yes, I've heard about that, said Gendoya, but I've never actually seen it. I'll go and hear what he's got to say. You all wait here. He and his men dismounted. The men hated to imagine what their master was up to, and afraid that he was going to go torment the preacher. When Gendaya came into the temple, some of the congregation simply got up and fled. He shoved his way through the rest, with the people parting before him like grass in a gale, till he came to the preacher and glared into his eyes. Preacher, he said, I want to know what you've been saying, and talk sense. If you don't, you'll wish you had, and he brandished his dagger. The frightened preacher thought he was lost, and his mind went blank, but he was wise enough to call on the Buddha for help before he answered. Westward from here, he answered, beyond many other worlds is the place where a Buddha lives. This Buddha's name is Amida. His kindness is wide and deep. You may have been the worst of sinners, but if you repent and you call upon his name, he will come to fetch you, and you will be reborn into his land of bliss, where you will be a Buddha too. If this Buddha of yours is as kind as all that, then I suppose he wouldn't turn me away either. Oh, of course not. So if I call his name, he will answer. Well, yes, if you call him sincerely. What people does this Buddha like best? Well, he doesn't reject anyone, but parents can't help loving their own children most, and so he does slightly prefer his own disciples. What is a disciple? Oh, any monk who shaved his head, like me. Laymen and laywomen can be his disciples too, but it's even better if you become a monk or a nun. Mm. Then shave my head, commanded Gendayu. Oh dear, the preacher exclaimed. It's wonderful to hear you say that, but you, you see, I can't just do it all of a sudden. If you're serious, you should first go home, talk it over with your family, and put all of your affairs in order. You call yourself a disciple of this Buddha, and you claim he tells only the truth, Gendaya growled. You say he loves his disciples. Then what do you mean by turning around now and telling me to do it later? You don't seem to understand, do you? So Gendaya drew his dagger, and he cut off his own top knot at the roots. The preacher was speechless, and a clamor burst from the congregation. Gendaya's men heard it too. Obviously their master had done something, and they rushed to the temple ready for a fight. Gendaya stopped them all with a loud roar. How dare you come between me and paradise, he bellowed. This morning as usual, I was wanting more men. But now, as far as I'm concerned, you can all get out and go wherever you please. I am not keeping any of you. The men decided their master had gone mad. Some spirit must have possessed him. They sobbed and howled and rolled on the floor, but Gendaya quickly put a stop to their noise. Then he offered his top knot to the Buddha. Heated water as fast as he could, washed his head, and came to the preacher again. Shave me properly, he ordered. You'll be sorry if you don't. Well, since you insist, the preacher replied, I'm sure it'd be wrong not to shave you. Yes, it would certainly be a sin. Though still afraid, he came down from his seat 
shaved Gendea's head, and administered the appropriate vowels. Gendea's men shed unrestrained tears of grief. Having put on a monk's stole, Gendea traded his quiver and bow for the devotee's little gong, which he hung around his neck. Now I am going to go west, he said. I'll keep calling Amida and beating this gong till he answers. No more, no mountain, river, or sea will turn me back. And off he went shouting, Hey, Amida Buddha! Hey, hey! When his men moved to follow him, he accused them of getting in his way, and kept beating his gong till they gave up. Gendea did just what he said he would do. He went straight west, calling upon the Amida and beating the gong. When he came to a river, he did not look for a ford. He did not try to find a way around. And when a mountain rose in front of him, stumbling and falling, he pushed straight ahead, till at sundown he reached a temple. Here he explained to the priest what he was doing. Now I'm going over these mountains to the west, he continued. Come and find me in seven days. I'll tie the grasses together as I go to mark the way. Do you have anything to eat? If you do, could you give me a little? The priest gave him plenty of parched rice, but Gendea, protesting that it was too much, took only a small amount, which he wrapped in paper and put in the fold of his robe. Then he started off. But the sun is down, the priest called after him. Stop here and rest for the night at least. But Gendea seemed not to have heard. Seven days later, the priest set out. The trail was marked, and it led over the mountains, beyond which rose all still another range. Looking westward from a peak, the priest saw the sea. At last, the priest came to a forked tree overlooking the ocean. Gendea was sitting up in the fork, beating his gong and calling, Hey, Amida! Hey, hey! He told the priest that he had meant to go on west to the sea, but Amida answers me here, he explained. So I stayed, and now I just keep calling to him. Well, what do you mean, he answers you, asked the priest, who could make nothing of all this. Well, I'll call. You'll hear him for yourself. And Gendea shouted, Hey, Amida, where are you? Here I am, replied an awesome voice from the depths of the very sea. You hear that? The priest had heard it, and dissolved, overcome in tears of joy and awe. Gendea wept too. Hurry home now, he said. Come back again in seven days, and let's see what's happened to me. Do you want anything? I brought you some parched rice. No, no, thank you. I still have some of the rice you gave me. The priest, in fact, could see the little packet of rice, wrapped just as it had been when Gendea left his temple. And off he went. When he came again, Gendea was still in the tree facing the west, but this time he was dead. A beautiful lotus flower had bloomed from his mouth, and the rat-weeping priest picked it. It occurred to him that he should bury Gendea, but he desired after all to leave him, since Gendea probably would have preferred simply to feed the birds and the beasts. Gendea had certainly gone on to paradise.